All right, everyone, welcome to the Data Resilience Spectrum Cast. We had a week off last week, and now we're back, continuing down our path of the six key things or the six key characteristics to build a truly data resilient architecture. So we started with the fact that you want to be able to have key administrative security privileges for your applications and your people. You want to be able to identify and monitor things going on within your environment making sure you have pervasive encryption. The last week we talked about making sure you have multiple layers of recovery. This week we're going to talk about the logical and physical air gapping of data. And uh, it's always interesting because there is a huge controversy, or I shouldn't say a huge controversy, but there is a controversy around what does air gap mean? What does it mean between air gapping and immutability? And what types of air gapping are there? Are there? So let's start off. Trisha, Sean, if you think about air gapping in general, what do we think about vis-a-vis -vis immutability? Hey, tape is always the first thing, and I think it's kind of the gold standard when we talk about air gap. Gold standard, that's right. <laughs> Sean, what's the difference between immutability and air gapping? Well, I was just to, to, to get back to your original question, what I think about when I think of air gapping is the time I did some consulting work for the CIA, believe it or not. I don't know if they'd like me discussing this or not. Um, it's been but nice I, knowing you. <laughs> <laughs> but they had actually this may have been another company. I don't remember. But they had a. It's server. too late, Sean. You're committed now. Just keep He's going. Battling already. Yeah. And this group of servers was in a room with one of these little flashing lights around the room, right? And these machines in this room were not connected to any other machines, period, end of discussion, right? If you wanted to use these machines, you went into that room. And when you left that room, that's when your access to these machines stopped, right? And to me, that was that is what a true air gap is. It is not remotely accessible or accessible electronically in any way, shape, or form. Period. End of discussion. I think that's that hardcore. Gets, yeah, right? I think that gets down to our. Uh, you know, we talk about air gapping and there's physical air gapping and logical air gapping. And as Trisha hit the nail on the head, right, the only true physical air gap is tape. I mean, you could say CDs or burning stuff off the CDs that you take out, but no one in IT really does that. Maybe maybe in the video space, but but today it's 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 tape. But that's the physical side. On the logical side, we have things such as uh, the cloud. So just get it off my corporate network to hide it. it might not be super secure but mm -hmm. i can't sniff around for it on my logic on my network there's cause so object storage can't be met, mucked with but could be deleted add mm -hmm. worm capabilities and you get you get the um ability to non-delete and not not change right um so those are those are all logical today right we know of no logical air gap breach. But I always tell customers, if it's connected in any way to the network, the hackers are going to figure out a way to get to it. And do you yes. want to be the first person <laughs> to have to say, oh, I thought it was air gapped? <laughs> well, and, and that makes, an, you, you know, that gets back to your original kind of hypothetical question about the difference between air gap and, and immutability. And they're related, but they are different, right? So, I mean, a, a data object or a piece of data would be considered immutable if it cannot, in theory, be either deleted or changed, right? So, that's the basic kind of rudimentary definition of immutability. Air gapping implies immutability, I think, because if, if data is physically or logically air gapped, then in theory, because it can't be accessed, you might then surmise that it can neither be deleted nor changed. So, there is a distinction there, which I think we often sort of lose sight of. I think we kind of munch them together sometimes when they are actually, you know, different concepts that have different implications for each. Um, but, you know, we, we often joke about, you know, Steve said kind of this big brewing internal debate around what's truly air gapped because, you know, air gapping is a physical definition, right? It is physical, you know, Sean, to your point, it is the physical, you know, proximity or lack thereof from one piece of data or one system to another to a network, right? So they are 
they are distinctly different things. Logically air gapped means, you know, it's, it's logically separated from the production, you know, single source of the truth, um, uh, system of record, but you know, there's no, there's no substitute for like a tape cartridge that's physically, you know, sitting in a mountain somewhere a <laughs> hundred miles away from the data center. Well, so. I mean, it, 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 it's become a marketing term. Right. And it, it's used to promote some measure of immutability. And I, I think to a large extent, all of the security related talk and decisions kind of come down to how much labor it costs you're willing to invest to make it so and difficulty you're willing to make it so. Uh, you know, like the, the system I described, right, where you have to actually go to a room to access it. That's a major inconvenience and a major headache from a from a from a use perspective, right? But from a security perspective, it's quote the best you can get, right? So we gotta have to balance these these two needs in order to come up with a solution, right? Well, that kind of goes back to what we were talking about uh, two weeks ago on having those multiple copies. So you have the on-site copy, original copy, and then you have these other copies elsewhere. And so the elsewhere becomes how elsewhere is that? Is it truly something that's often a storage vault that's on a tape or is it up in the cloud, which is air gapped in the sense that it's not on the same system as your primary server. And, and that's the trade-off there, the accessibility, the ease of bringing those systems back. Because if you had that tape, the restore is gonna be a lot slower. Yes, it's air gapped, yes, it's there, but it's not as fast as my tool tip for today, which oh, is excellent. we now have the, we've had the ability for a while to have your Spectrum Protect servers running out on the cloud. So you could actually have a second Spectrum Protect server, which you could replicate your primary on-site data out to the cloud. And now you've got that cloud copy, which is separated and not on the same network. And we have a beta going on right now for anybody who's interested of a tile inside of the IBM cloud, which you click that tile and it's gonna deploy a Spectrum Protect server for you. It's gonna do the, the deploying, the creating of the database, the logs, the storage pools. And so then you can have a replication server for your primary server very rapidly. Nice, that's very cool. Good tip. So we've all said a few things here that all kind of play a part in, in, in this overall spectrum of what we're doing and building a resilient environment. Randy, you said something important that Fraser often talks to us about around the physical and logical side of things. And, you know, the, the one thing Fraser always tells us, our competitive guru, right, is that tape actually has to be removed from the device or technically it's still online and it, and it can be, it can be gotten to. And, and I think there are some, some examples Good of that. Point. Yeah, um, Sean, you, you mentioned um, kind of the pain, uh, the labor costs, et cetera, of doing all this. And, and, and maybe, and, and Tricia, you actually, you kind of helped uh, speed up that process by talking about what's <laughs> available in the cloud. My question is, okay, so, so we, we, know, we know we believe we want some form of air gapping to be more secure, right? The question is, what are the trade-offs when it comes to that when architecting an environment? Is it, is it, RPO? Is it RTO? Is it nothing? You know, why do we not do this, right? What, what are the challenges? So the first challenge is going to be that if we're talking tape, tape is requires a lot of manual intervention by people because someone's got to load the tapes, someone's got to then take the tapes out, send them to, via FedEx or whatever to that um, Iron Mountain secure location. And then if you have a failure, you got to bring them back on site, reinsert them into the library and, and, and reread off of them. So that's a manual process, but the storage is cheap because the cost of storing on tape is going to be very inexpensive. So you've got this, this trade-off. And maybe what you have to look at is saying, okay, I'm going to have that copy on tape as my last resort if my copy on my primary server as well as the cloud server gets hit somehow, I've still got that tape out there. See, I, I, I think this all comes under the category of security is expensive, right? And the, the better security you have, the more expensive it's going to be from a labor perspective. And you kind of want to 
as, as Tricia just said, it's a balance, right? It's how much am I going to invest to get this added layer of security uh, and, 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 you know, and weigh those two things against each other and come up with a plan that's reasonable. Yeah, uh, it, and it's always, it's always that kind of actuarial analysis between how much are you willing to invest and what's your risk exposure, right? So um, depending on your environment and your industry and kind of what compliance you have to uh, fulfill and support, you know, you may or may not be willing to make that investment and just roll the dice and hope that, you know, when something bad inevitably happens, your exposure is, uh, is not too extreme. Yeah. And, and tape has this kind of unique use case in that from a media perspective, it is very inexpensive, the most inexpensive thing you can possibly buy. So that makes it a good choice for long-term retention, right? or for data that maybe I'm going to have to get to this, but I probably won't, right? So I'm going to keep it out here for, you know, many, many, many years. Uh, and It's also very stable, have, right? It's also very stable, shelf stable too, yeah. which is another thing yeah. that makes it good for long-term retention. Right? So Sean, I, I, I like where you're going with, with cost because everything in IT is this balance of, of kind of performance and cost and, and that sort of thing. Here's my question, right? Um, and and I, I believe the fundamental answer and objective is, what are the SLAs of the business? And how, and how do you make sure you can meet those, right? And, and getting data back, if it takes three weeks, can meet an SLA of the business because I got the data back, I didn't lose it, right? But what's the SLA of the business to keep it running? And my question then becomes, if we know today... A, tr a typical backup environment is backup to disk for operational recovery, fast recovery, and then, you know, taking advantage of best practices, three, two, one, one, getting it offsite or getting on another media type and, and getting it offsite. How much more expensive is, is that first operational copy going to cost me if that, if that uh, pool where that data lands is immutable or air gapped, meaning, you know, it's a cause device or something vis-a-vis -vis just like a straight, you know, let's call it a, a flash system 5,000, right? Is it much more expensive to have the first copy, a disk copy, which can be fast, right? Something that's immutable or something that's not? Well, I think that also really addresses licensing questions, which I always try and avoid. But when you ask about if my primary copy is wherever, can I still make secondary and third copies at no extra cost? Or is my software licensing going to charge me for making those copies? Because with Spec and Protect, you can have that initial copy to your point on disk. And, and how expensive is that disk? Well, the licensing wise versus hardware wise versus, um, you know, the, the mechanics of the computer wise. Yeah, figure that out, but then take those extra copies at no extra license cost, sending them to a different Spectrum Protect server through replication, sending them to tape through copy storage pools. Randy, you, again, we always go to you for the spin of, of the wheel of misfortune. When, and, and I, I made a comment about, hey, if it, even though it's, it's, it's logically air gapped, and my assumption is sooner or later, that, you know, me playing defense all the time, <laughs> the hackers are going to figure this out. What, you, you came up with something around the hacker's lexicon to air gapping. You want to share that with us? Yeah. So, so of course, as usual, um, you know, we got to go right to the source when we talk about, uh, you know, what these things mean and, and sort of put the black hat on and, and look at it from the perspective of the bad actors and, and those who are trying to disrupt your environment and, and access information um, on your network or on your system. So, you know, a, a couple of things in this article that I thought were kind of interesting. So air gapping has a, some, a variety of meanings. I mean, it's a limited number, but there are some different meanings. It is primarily or fundamentally thought of as a system or a network of systems, which are physically, as Sean said earlier, physically and logically isolated. So they're not connected to any other network or any other systems. They're not connected to the internet. You know, they're in the 
you know, room at the three letter agency that Sean mentioned earlier, um, that you physically have to be in proximity to those things to access them. So that's one definition. Um, so, so by that definition, again, a, a true air gap is a physically isolated system or, or, you know, tape cartridge, for example, that has information on it, uh, that is separated by, you know, physical distance and, and, and air, you know, that's the term air gap, right? Now that does then introduce the idea that we've talked about a little bit for logical air gapping, which is kind of isolation by network segment or by some other firewall or mechanism that, you know, logically prevents that. But of course, as, as we've discussed, that's not inherently as secure uh, as physical air gapping. What's interesting, or, and, and I'd heard a little bit about this, but I didn't realize kind of how advanced the research was here, is that there are new methods being developed whereby um, even data that is physically disconnected from the network can be siphoned using radio frequencies, radio waves. Um, so there are researchers in, in Israel, of course, where all the most advanced you know research in both probably hacking and cybersecurity takes place. Um, that information can be siphoned off of systems um, using radio waves, assuming that those systems utilize um, network communication. Now, I'm assuming that this would not be applicable to something like a tape cartridge, which is not, you know, when it's sitting on a shelf in Iron Mountain, it's not transmitting or receiving anything. It's just, you know, ones and zeros on physical media. So I'm assuming it would not be prone to that. But interestingly, there are now ways that um, air gapped networks, that is to say, small isolated networks of systems that are disconnected from the internet or from other systems might in theory still be hackable using something like a radio wave or a, an RF um, penetration kind of uh, methodology. So, you know, the, 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 the headline here, the broader story is yes, air gapping is a physical isolation of a system or um, a data set from others. However, um, that itself also potentially has some vulnerabilities. So you even have to think about um, how mobile the data is once it's isolated and if it's moving around, can it be sniffed or siphoned off uh, using something like an, an RF attack or an RF penetration? So, you know, again, as we talk about all the time, the, the bad guys are, you know, are, are, are aggressive and they're usually one step ahead of us. So, you know, we've always got to be thinking about ways that we can uh, reduce that kind of risk. So, you know, I'll go back to Sean's, uh, you know, secret room analogy you know, in many ways, some of the techniques and methodologies that are being thought about and considered today are from the very early days of security. It's a physical bunker that probably has like a Faraday cage built around it. So there's no way for it to be penetrated by radio waves. And that's kind of where we are. It's like the attacks are getting so sophisticated now that we've got to sort of go back to the, you know, prehistoric age of, of data protection and kind of keep our stone tablets locked up, you know, deep within the, uh, the core of the earth. So it's, well, uh, it's a never ending discussion. You know? I was just going to say, you know, on the system that I was speaking about, right. You know, again, this depends on how serious you are about protecting things and how you think you're, how you think, what you think your vulnerabilities are. But I guarantee you, these systems were not connected to any Wi-Fi networks, right? That was, that would have been a no-go. Well, that, and, that goes back to our discussion even fewer um, more weeks ago with, about encryption. So now we're talking yeah. about everything that's going across the network, even internally, having yep. the SSL encrypted or such. Right. So mm -hmm. that that's number one. But the other thing I was going to say is, too, they were very serious. These people who I were working with were very serious about any sort of electronic devices. Right. Mm. So you did not, you know, when you access this room, when you access the building, you emptied your pockets, you emptied yeah. your everything of any sort of electronic device that could be used to transfer anything to any sort of computer, mm -hmm. right? And that was just a part of their security protocol and a part of the way they prevented it from being accessed, right? Yep. Uh, so, but, you know, I mean, one, one assumed that was top level security, right? They, they inconvenienced a lot of people by doing that. No, sure. They, they made themselves a lot less productive Let's say. Well, and and those kind of you know those kind of high security dark sites like that you know are are by definition of course incredibly restrictive and and it's you know I think this all portends a movement towards that level of security and that level of of kind of diligence and and rigor 
being associated with private industry and commercial entities and not just governmental entities, right? I mean, everybody wants to have the highest possible level of security they can reasonably fund. So I, I think we'll see more of that. But Well, I mean, I, I'll get to, let, let me ask you this and I'll kind of get, I'll bring this up with regard to Steve's point about logical air gapping, mm -hmm. right? Back in the day, 25 years ago, 30 years ago, we used to consider a firewall enough of a quote air gap to to prevent our data from being hacked and being stolen right all of our systems sat on the other side of a firewall and for the most part there was no ssl on behind that firewall it was just happy go lucky right plug in anything you want as long as you're physically there and today that that has just gone totally by the the wayside Chris, you're shaking your head no Oh, I'm agreeing. agreeing. Oh, you, oh, you're agreeing. You can get, get away with that nowadays. Yeah. You know, it's interesting. One of the things we hear about today around air gapping, a uh, physical air gapping, um, is, uh, so let's say I do a backup and then I replicate that backup to another site, but I cut, I cut the line between the two, the two replica sites when, when, when nothing's happening. Um, seems like a lot of work to me seems like at some point that thing on the other side has to be on online somewhere somehow so it can still be gotten to but uh you know th that's some of those are some of the methodologies people are people are using i, I guess um again it seems like a lot of work i mean it provides less of a vector right less of a footprint to attack yeah. rather than it being vulnerable 24 hours a day it's only vulnerable for the hopefully one hour that it takes you to make that replicated copy right i mean i i, I tend to agree with you it's it, it it seems like the the attacker would target that that time frame when it's available to take advantage of it right it's like saying i'm gonna lock my door 23 hours a day but leave it open for the other one it's like oh well you just have to make sure Robert it's not the same around. hour every day that's all you just have to shift it around so <laughs> well and i mean it all gets back to the core theme of a lot of these discussions we've had which is that security and you know vulnerability and prevention just have to continue to keep pace with the advancements in you know penetration and and the malicious activity of the people you know doing these attacks so it's a it's a constant cat and mouse game i think which is going to continue you know forever until we're back to the stone age again and i and i think what you said there randy prevention is, is definitely key and i think one of the better ways or one of the best ways to keep up with with prevention is the practice component and the automation and orchestration components. And, and that's next week's conversation. So next week, we're going to talk about what automation and orchestration can bring to this overall data resilient uh, situation that comes up. And then we actually have uh, coming up after that, a guest speaker uh, who's going to join us, Pete Bray from Red Hat, who wants to talk about how uh, Red Hat fits into this whole overall equation, both from a from an application side and the things that they're building on and what we're doing jointly together. So I'm really looking forward cool. to that. Team, uh, thank you very much for uh, for helping to talk about the different types of air gapping and immutability and kind of where we go from here and rounding out the fifth of our six key capabilities for building an immutable environment. We are in the home stretch now. We, we are in the home stretch. Uh, I want to thank you all. Thank you for your tooltip. Randy, thank you for your spin on the wheel of uh, uncertainty there. And uh, we'll see you all next week. All right. Thanks, Steve. Bye.